All right, good afternoon, everybody. Um, here with uh, Josh and Paul and some great educators uh, today, because uh, yesterday we talked about K through 12 education, what it looks like through June 30 in the summer and going beyond. And today we're going to talk about uh, higher education. But first, just let me give you a quick update, our daily summary. Um, Thankfully, uh, hospitalizations are back down again. Everybody was saying, what are you going to do if the hospitalizations creep up? And uh, what we saw yesterday, I hope, was uh, just a one-day blip. And uh, tests are continuing. We're rolling that out, rolling that up. Uh, importantly, the positive cases is still a, a smaller percentage. It's about 13 percent. And that's, of course, a good sign as one indication of what's going on in terms of community spread. The next chart is uh, the one we've seen before, which just again tells you that our um, three-day moving average on hospitalizations continues to trend down. And that means that keeps our May 20th um, planning date intact and uh, what we plan to do going on uh, this summer. So yesterday we had uh, Miguel Cardona, our Commissioner of Education. We had Beth Bai from um, Early Childhood talk a little bit about um, learning. It's going to be um, online learning, virtual learning, um, as we've been doing um, over the last two months, you know, for the next uh, six weeks, taking us through the June 30th date. Then we talked about how we're going to roll out uh, slowly in terms of um, summer programs, summer camp, easier to do outdoors as opposed to indoors, safer to do, have an educational component to our summer camps, and then summer school as we lead into back-to-school activities to get our kids back up to speed since uh, they won't have been in the formal classroom that, then for some months, and then what some of our plans are for a K through 12 starting uh, soon thereafter. Uh, you know, with that, we're going to talk today about what we do in our um, university space and continuing learning. Uh, before I introduce our all-star panel, um, I would like to say we have one more announcement uh, I wanted to make. And that's a program we're rolling out now called Skill Up Connecticut. It's going to be free of charge to anybody who is uh, on unemployment right now, anybody who has uh, lost their job. And it's a free program the state is going to make available to each and every one of you. It gives you licensing, online licensing opportunities. It's skill sets across the spectrum from IT and customer service and program management. So. Uh, don't let this time go to waste, not if you're a student, not if you're somebody who has um, sadly lost your job. Uh, with that, what I wanted to do was introduce to you um, some of our incredible higher education panel that, that was part of our Reopen Connecticut um, uh, team. And that's going to be led off by, um, and gives a brief presentation in just a few minutes, Rick Levin. Uh, Rick Levin um, is a friend that I've known for many years. You know him as uh, the former president of Yale University, uh, leading residential college. And he was also CEO at Coursera, which is probably the leading online university in the world. So if we think about education going forward, K through 12 and higher education is a continuing mix of online and um, you know, in-person classroom, nobody better suited to uh, take the lead in our um, reopen education committee than a uh, Rick. He's accompanied by his um, you know, uh, wingman, and that's Linda Lorimer. They've worked together for years and helped to lead the charge for us as well. Of course, we have Marco Jakin. Everybody knows uh, Marco Jakin. He um, runs Connecticut State Colleges and University, knows his way around Hartford. Talk about education in terms of a slightly different constituency. Um, you know, listening to Rick and Linda and, and the team, you realize um, we think about reopening in a number of different contexts, not just the gating functions, but also, as you've heard, we think about it in terms of uh, indoors and outdoors, since you're 90 percent more likely to get infected indoors than out of doors. Um, you know, listening, um, you know, to these experts, you know, we've also think about uh, gating in terms of um, residential colleges and uh, Marco, you know, because obviously a residential college is a place where you're much more likely to uh, have the uh, opportunity to pick up COVID and uh, versus our uh, community colleges and those that don't have a big residential component. And I think you'll hear Rick talk a little bit about how we can ramp up in terms of um, what type of schooling we do. And uh, Mark is the front line in terms of our community colleges as well, where we're going to have a big effort. and. Even when it comes to residential, I, I'm, I'm reminded that um, 
Age is important as well as one of our gating functions. And uh, obviously for folks over the age of 60 or 65, we're recommending they stay safe, stay at home, be you a teacher or in the general population. Um, and, and Rick and Lyndon, the team, reminded me there's also an age component um, within the student body themselves. And maybe we think about um, a graduate students is more likely to be able to get back to the residence halls first, a little more safely, more likely to perhaps honor the social distancing rules than an undergraduate might be. Um, I saw Animal House for the 13th time this weekend, so I'm sympathetic to the difficulty of enforcing social distancing in an undergraduate uh, residence hall. Um, after Marco Jakin, of course, we have Tom Katsalaus, whose students call him Tom Cat. He's the uh, president at uh, UConn and is right on the front lines. Uh, be there to answer any questions you've got in terms of the plans of UConn. And finally, uh, Dr. Joanne Berger Sweeney, who um, is a great friend of mine, runs Trinity College, president of Trinity, a smaller liberal arts residential college. And I'm, they'll all be available to answer questions about how they're thinking about education this summer and this fall, and what are the different benchmarks we need to uh, slowly open up our education facility. Look, education is so key to our state. It's a $10 billion industry. About 45,000 people work in higher education, almost 200,000 students. It is uh, important as an economic driver, and it's also key to the future of our state and our country to keep the best education system in the world, led, led by our higher education, going and going strong. So with that, uh, Rick, um, what have you learned and what can people um, count on this summer and fall from higher ed? Thank you, Governor, and thank you so much for the privilege of serving along with uh, a really outstanding committee uh, that looked at this problem of under what circumstances and at what time for, on, in what time frame could our colleges and universities throughout the state reopen? Um, if you put the first slide up, please, Max. We're going to have slides. Okay, there we go. Um, so our approach as a committee, and we, by the way, we represented the entire sector. Uh, we had representatives from the private colleges and from the public uh, universities as well. Um, deeply, everyone dug in really deeply. We consulted very widely uh, all the institutions in the state and many outside the state find out what people were thinking about reopening. We all came to it with a keen appreciation of the importance of higher education to our economy and the importance of higher education to the lives and the future careers of nearly 200,000 students here. There's obviously a tension between safety and getting back uh, reopened. And we tried to weigh that balance very carefully and think about trying to do this in a phased way with minimal risk as we move forward. We were also very mindful of the heterogeneity of colleges and universities in this state. Um, and we developed a phase plan for reopening with that in mind. You can go to the next slide. Um, so as the governor just mentioned, in, the institutions around our state differ considerably in the populations they serve and in the mode of, uh, of <clears throat> delivery. So um, there are undergraduates and graduate students who differ primarily in, in uh, age and we, Posit in social maturity so that uh, observance of the, um, the constraints on distancing and density um, uh, that are, that are going to be necessary as we phase a reopening uh, are probably more likely to be observed uh, assiduously by graduate students. So that's they're, they're essentially a lower risk category of population. And then, of course, residential institutions and non-residential institutions differ. Non-residential institutions um, are really much more like businesses. People come in to a, a community college or to some of our non-residential uh, private institutions and take their class, take maybe two classes, and go home. And so they're encountering people, just as you would in a retail store or in, in an office. Um, uh, but if social distancing is maintained in those spaces, we, we think it's reasonably safe to think of those institutions like we think of businesses and to have them start to open as the business, as the various business sectors open. Um, residential uh, education poses a much higher risk because here we have students living with each other 24-7 under circumstances, particularly for undergraduates, that 
you know, traditionally, it's been a close social life. You spend time with people. You sit in dorm rooms and talk all night. These kinds of things are um, uh, uh, do pose a much higher risk, and so there's a higher hurdle for reopening there. Graduate student residential programs are somewhat intermediate because they um, because of the greater maturity of graduate students. Next uh, slide, please. Um, uh, we uh, looked at, our, at the problem this way, that, that safety implied that you wanted to have public health requirements that applied to all students and all institutions. We, want, we, we, we definitely wanted people to observe whatever the best public health guidance is at the time that we go back into business. Heterogeneity implied that we need to leave some in independence for the, for the schools, for each campus, um, because they all differ, and the way they would implement a reopening might differ considerably. Linda will talk about that in a minute. So we basically, in our report, and this is all advisory to the governor, who, for, who we're very grateful, has essentially accepted uh, our recommendations moving forward, um, we believe that the state must establish the gating conditions for reopening. That is to say, what underlying public health conditions, what social constraints need to be in place to reopen. And then each college and university should be free to develop its own plans. And we give a lot of guidance in the report about how those plans might be shaped. Now, one thing that must be kept in mind is the situation is fluid. We don't know today whether the gating conditions will be met in time for a full reopening of campuses in the fall. In particular, we don't know if prevailing health conditions will stay safe enough to, to warrant reopening. Um, if there's a rise in hospitalizations during the course of the summer, any kind of second wave, <clears throat> the governor may well declare that uh, the various phases have to be delayed and reopening will not be possible. Um, so schools need to be flexible. They need to be ready to open, but they also need to be ready uh, to move online if absolutely necessary. And schools should have the flexibility to decide, I'm going to I'm going to play safer than the guidelines allow. I'm only going to take part of my student body back at the beginning, or maybe delay opening till October or something thereafter. Next slide. Um, here are the gating conditions that we think must be in place for a safe reopening. First, there needs to be an improvement in the prevalence of the disease, a steady decline in hospitalization. And that'll, that signal will be interpreted by public health officials and decided upon by the governor as we move through the summer. Second, there need to be an adequate number of tests made available um, so, that, so, that, so that we can comprehensively test um, students in our residential institutions and test as appropriate when health conditions warrant in our non-residential institutions. We need to have a capacity for contact tracing. Um, there's some promising apps that may make that easier. We'll see as the summer goes along on this too. We need to have statewide guidelines on physical distancing, on density of classrooms and dormitories and other public spaces, um, and we need to have guidance on the wearing of face masks. We need to have adequate supplies of PPE for our health professionals and face masks for students, faculty, and staff. We need to have adequate hospitals and, health and local health facilities to have surge capacity to handle a potential outbreak. And finally, um, we, we are requesting of the governor that he, that for institutions that observe these um, so statewide guidelines on public health and who develop plans and file them with the state, that those institutions should be safe from lawsuits that might allege that they're responsible for students uh, coming down with the virus. Next slide, please. Next, next slide. Yeah, uh, so here's just, in brief, I don't want to dwell on this, but here's just a glimpse at what some of the social um, public health guidelines are. And these, these guidances will be in force until the state relaxes them. Um, uh, and that could be sooner, it could be later, depending on health conditions. Um, institutions may, of course, choose to impose stricter guidelines. So we're, we're basically relying on six foot of separation wherever you can possibly do it. So classrooms and dining halls and other areas, some words left out on the slide where people congregate, um, uh, we would we would want those rooms set up so that there's six feet of separation maintained between students. Now that means it's not quite the same intimate conversation in the dining hall, and that means that classrooms might not be able to fit everyone in a particular class, and the class might have to meet in two sections. 
And we've gone through it. We, we, we give universities a lot of guidance about ways they might think about um, uh, using their campus more efficiently to handle more students. But we recognize that preserving physical distancing between students may lead to a somewhat reduced capacity of the institution to serve its entire student body. Um, in dormitories, the public health guidance we got from public health um, experts was that we could treat roommates and suite mates as though they were a family unit. So we don't have to have necessarily everyone in single rooms, which would drastically reduce the size of our student body. Um, so but then we would just ask that six foot spacing be preserved elsewhere on the campus. And at the moment, at least it's advisable as it is for everyone in the state to wear masks. Um, I'm gonna have Linda turn, take the last two slides. Thank you. The governor encouraged us to think, what do the colleges and universities need to do themselves to be ready to welcome back their students? As Rick says, there will be plans, but we really think that each institution needs to create four separate plans. The first is a plan for repopulation of the campus, the bringing back of students, which will be under, in most cases, a phased sequencing, which I'll turn to in a minute. But then they really need to think through now, not later in the fall. What would be the plan for monitoring the health conditions to detect infection? And we think for residential institutions, that will begin when students actually arrive back on campus. And we make sure that we can isolate them, uh, those who test positively, before you put them into their dormitory rooms. And then at, at a sequence during the year, continue to monitor those in residential facilities. It seems almost inevitable that there will be those students who contract the virus, and there then must be a plan for containment, since particularly, again, in the residential settings, it could spread quite quickly. Uh, we, we want every institution, residential and non-residential, to come up with those kinds of plans. And then the fourth uh, facet of the institutional planning in the next month or so is a plan for shutdown, which could occur in one of two ways. One, we could have a statewide problem arise in which the governor would have to, again, create a statewide shutdown. Or it could be that there is an uptick on a single campus, which would warrant uh, a close of that place. So every uh, college and university president is being asked in this report to create the four best plans that will ensure the safety of the students and help to create the best educational environment that we that we really can. In terms of the plan for repopulation, uh, there are phases that we have constructed in the next slide. And these, ne the next slide, it's intended to show the earliest dates, and I want to underscore the earliest dates in which each kind of activity might start occurring. And there are two caveats. One, that uh, some institutions may well decide that they don't want to open as early for that kind of activity as would be permitted here. And the other is that the underlying health conditions and other gating conditions that Rick outlined may not be met. But we just wanted to say that as soon as May 20th, we think, again, with fingers crossed that the health conditions are, are satisfying, that research programs can start up. Research programs in many ways are like a form of business. And, and indeed, there's so much medical, um, very good, important work going on in our state to address the virus situations. But we would hope the very first phase, this phase 1A, would be the return of the research programs. The second one, which could occur soon thereafter, at the beginning of June, would be for non-residential workforce and degree completion programs. There are a number of students, actually, who this spring were caught in these kinds of programs and had to continue only their uh, classroom-based instruction online, but were not able to complete, say, their work in the shops or in clinical settings, which often are very low density. So we want those students to be able to complete what they're doing now and also important workforce development programs that are non-residential to be able to get up and started as soon as the institutions think they can uh, after the beginning of June. The second phase would be then in July or August, where we hope that other non-residential programs might be prepared to begin um, and be coupled with the kind of graduate programs Rick mentioned, since graduate programs are often smaller, many of them are non-residential or have fewer residential students and do have students who are older. 
we have been in conversation with a couple of institutions who may, in the second half of the summer, also want to experiment with some small-scale residential undergraduate programs. Imagine like the second half of a summer school in which they could kind of perfect what the guidelines might be, be for the implementation of larger residential settings come the fall. And then the third phase, which would be September 1, the traditional going back to school time for colleges and universities, we think that it could be ready, again, with the prevailing health uh, situations um, improving and with the gating conditions met that undergraduate residential pro pro programs can begin for those institutions that are ready for them. And you'll see another line for boarding schools, which obviously is not part of the higher education community, but it's been part of the conversation of our committee since the boarding schools face very similar challenges to the undergraduate residential institutions. So this is the idea we had to really have a phasing so that we could be prepared to welcome as many students as we can if the prevailing health conditions warrant and if schools feel that they're ready. Thanks, Rick. Thanks, Linda. Mark, do you want to sum things up before we take some questions? Uh, thank you, Governor. Um, uh, first of all, thank you for your leadership um, on this effort. Um, I also want to thank uh, Rick and Linda for the incredible job they did um, of shepherding this through um, the advisory committee process with a great group of folks um, on the team. Um, this is an incredible effort and your leadership is greatly appreciated. Uh, the governor has asked me to serve as the state lead on the higher education uh, piece of this effort. Um, we all know how important it is for us to open up our colleges and universities. But the report that you have today relies heavily on public health experts. And we need to make sure that all of the guidelines are adhered to before we will be comfortable welcoming students, faculty, and staff back to our schools. You know, the health of our campus community is and continues to be the top priority. So we will not move forward until all of the conditions um, have been met and we can give reasonable assurances to faculty, staff, students, and their families that we are in a position uh, to reopen up. I look forward to working with my colleagues in the higher education world in the state of Connecticut. Um, I also just want to echo one thing that, that Rick did um, indicate. This is not one size fits all. Uh, we will adapt institution by institution or system by system a plan according to the guidelines that have been issued. We're all very different. We serve very different students. We're in very different geographic areas. Uh, but the one consistent theme will be we will not reopen until we have reasonable assurance that all of our campus community will come back to school and be healthy and safe. So once again, Governor, thank you very much uh, for your leadership. As my colleague Joanne Berger Sweeney said a little while ago, uh, you've been very um, much on the cutting edge and forward thinking nationally on this issue. And so thank you for everything you've done. All right, OJ, thank you. We're now open to questions. I just want to remind you, if you have any particularly complicated questions, please ask Tom Katsalaeus or Joanne Berger Sweeney. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> Go first to Channel 3, Eyewitness News. Uh, yes, you know, I have a real quick question about uh, faculty. Students might not be at the highest risk, but the faculty might. We're talking about, like, the professors, the cafeteria workers. Uh, what's the protection for them? So I'd be happy to, to answer if that's, if that's okay. So, uh, you know, as we're preparing for returning... September 1st at full strength, we're also preparing for other contingencies, including having faculty prepare their courses to be online. And so for those faculty who are in a high risk category or uncomfortable coming back in the fall, we expect to be able to accommodate them to deliver their course online. And that has a dual advantage that there are some students who won't be able to come back because they're in high risk health categories, or in our case, 10% of our student population is international. And we expect that some of those 
students will have a hard time coming back because of travel restrictions. So having a mix of in-person and online options for students is our goal, and that will accommodate um, the health concerns for the faculty as well. So I guess, you know, based on the demographics at the universities, um, how much of the learning do you expect could be done online this semester? So, uh, so, I think, I'm, so I'm sorry, Tom. So I, I think the, the plan um, is to move forward and try to conduct as much instruction in person um, as possible, understanding that that we may need to have hybrids um, depending on class sizes, depending on other conditions that are um, at the institution. So I think as we all collectively and individually plan, we have to account for different scenarios. Um, and one of those scenarios is, can I conduct classes virtually and in person on a couple days a week? Um, we're, we're looking at all the options to make it as easy um, for students as possible. Right. The only thing that I want to add, this is Joanne Berger Sweeney, is we have different kinds of institutions. And the residential institutions and liberal arts institutions like Trinity College are going to try to have face-to-face -face instruction when possible because we think that's the best way um, to teach, to deliver the kind of education that we offer. So I think all that's why I love this plan because it understands that different institutions may come to slightly different solutions. News 8. For Marco Jakey and a lot of your work, a lot of your students are needed on the front lines from the nurses to the medical techs, x-ray techs. Are you accelerating any of those programs to get them out quicker or giving them more priority or broadening them? Well, I think, I think what we're doing is a couple of things. First of all, I think we're working with the licensing boards to make sure we can streamline uh, those activities so uh, frontline workers can go where they're needed uh, quicker. Um, we are working with local area hospitals uh, to be able to provide more practicums on a expedited uh, basis. Um, so we're looking at everything we can do um, to provide a sort of um, expedited experience, but while not sacrificing the quality um, of the instruction um, that a student needs to receive in order to be able to perform that kind of work. All right. <clears throat> and for UConn President Tomcat, has the NCAA given you any guidelines? Because we're talking about students, athletes, possibly traveling to other universities, being together on planes or buses. How is that going to work? And has the NCA weighed in on it all? Yeah, well, obviously, an individual university can't make a unilateral decision about intercollegiate competition because you have to take that up in coordination with the people you're competing with and against. And so the NCAA and our conferences are the key vehicle by which we have those conversations. So in some senses, the NCAA is we, and uh, th those conversations are continuously taking place with our athletic directors. Keep going, man. So have they weighed in at all? There are no decisions made at this point. It's too soon to be able to say. I think it, they're in a similar position of create, you know, creating contingency plans, uh, just like the academic side of the house is. And similarly, the goal is to come back. I mean, we're all hopeful that that um, we can resume full operations in the fall, and we're all working towards that. But at the same time, creating contingencies for um, for other options if that doesn't if, if that's not safe to do. We'll move along next to NBC Connecticut. Yes. What are universities noticing in terms of attendance for the coming school year? Any budget concerns that you're noticing with the coronavirus? I think I can take that speaking to the whole array of institutions in the state. I think there's a lot of concern um, among institutions. Um, I, think, I think it's almost a certainty that there will be some decline in enrollment. As uh, Tom mentioned, international students likely not to come back. Some schools have a very high percentage of international students. Others have very few. So that's the differential impact. Um, there are some uh, uh, there are some students who we think will want to take a gap year rather than come back, given all the uncertainty and uncertainty about whether there might be a second wave of 
the disease in the fall or later in the, or in the winter. Um, so I, I, I think it's pretty likely that there'll be some reduction in enrollment and that will be a budget problem for many institutions. Um, it, it's, um, I'll leave it there. That's, that's the big point. And how soon do universities need to have these plans ready? Um, would the state need to approve them before the universities could begin? Because it seems like the reopening process could begin as early as May 20th to some level. Oh, that's right. We, 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 are, we're at, we really are leaving the schools um, on their own to develop these plans and file them with the state. There will not be a bureaucratic approval process. So um, uh, that, that, uh, that, so that that shouldn't delay. Schools that want to reopen early will have to complete a plan in time to do that. Right. Yeah. And then my last thing is regarding technical schools, um, a lot of what they do is more hands-on and in-person. How will that work for them? Will there be a separate plan for them? I think that'll be up to the to the state. Uh, we looked, we did look at the technical and vocational aspects of of um, our community colleges, uh, uh, some of the state college, state uh, universities, and some of the private institutions that have <clears throat> nursing programs and other um, and other hands-on professions that they that they train for. Um, and as you see, where those things are laboratory-based or studio-based or, or shop-based, um, we think if you can preserve social spacing, that could start pretty soon in the summer, uh, as early as June. Um, so I think that those guidelines would probably need to be examined for, by whoever's responsible for that in the state and decide with how to move forward with vocational schools. Uh, Marco Jakin, would you, Marco Jakin, would you like to chime in on the technical school yes, question? Yes, thank you, thank you. Um, um, what I would just like to say is, you know, many of our community colleges have workforce development programs um, that are very um, already um, operating with social distancing, just as the norm manufacturing, for example, where people are on equipment that is spaced between um, one another and there's not a lot of folks on the shop floor, so to speak. Those are ones that we will be looking to get up and going sooner rather than later. And there's many others like that. I think what this report does is gives us that flexibility um, to start up those workforce programs um, with the social distancing requirements um, that are indicated in the report. Move along next to Fox 61. How are you guys considering the long-term effects on students who can't return to the classroom? Like you said, a number of students thrive and learn best in classroom settings, and there is a big possibility that won't happen even in the fall. For example, some professors are switching to a pass-fail grade system, but what about students who get lost in this switch to virtual learning? Well, maybe I will, you know, start by saying um, that at independent colleges, what we're trying to make sure is that students have the kind of support services they need to thrive. Whether they are learning face-to-face -face or whether they are learning online and remotely, it's important that they have the services they need to be able to thrive. And so as we are considering going back to teaching, we're also thinking about those kinds of support services that the students will need to thrive. And I think every part of the industry is trying to think about those kinds of matters and not simply just putting a course online and hoping students do the best. Those additional supports will continue to be offered throughout our educational system. Yeah. And if I could just piggyback on that, um, Joanne, um, what we've all tried to do is provide the best sort of um, online support, not only academically, but in terms of other um, uh, support services, uh, whether it's tutoring, whether it's advising, whether it's mental health services that we can no longer provide um, on ground right now. And I, th I think collectively we've all done a great job in making that transition. Um, and as we move forward, 
Um, we're going to have to continue to provide those services and look to the most vulnerable um, to, um, to to even provide that to a greater extent. So it's clearly on all of our collective radar screens. You know, I've met with a number of students uh, in, and uh, to a person, I asked them this question, which has been the more difficult adjustment for you, the academic adjustment or the social adjustment to being online? And every single student so far has said that that it's been the social adjustment. And to the points that Joanne and Mark made, you know, our full array of mental health services are still being provided, but virtually it's difficult to do. We've also uh, introduced some, some new approaches. We have a, an initiative called You Kindness, which uh, pairs up uh, volunteers to provide social support, from, mostly from the alumni base, uh, to connect to students, and, and that's been adopted uh, widely by students and by alums, and both seem to value it greatly. So, you know, we have to be creative in approaching this, and, and uh, you know, all learners are different, and the idea is to try to be as flexible and as accommodating as we can and supportive. Well, and then what is your message to parents of prospective students worried about sending their freshmen into your schools come fall? Well, I think I feel, let me just start because I think what I would what I would say is what I said previously. We're not going to reopen our campuses until there's adequate assurances that all of the public safety guidelines have been met at a minimum. Um, many of us may decide to um, to issue stricter guidelines depending on our student demographics and where we're located. So I would say that if we're going to be open to greet students. We're going to be the, the healthiest and the safest places uh, to go. So I, I view this as a positive uh, to say we will be open for business. We will be open to greet students and their families. And while everybody's going to be anxious um, in starting a normal existence again, um, we will be ready and we will have met the public safety, public health guidelines. We will. Right. And the only thing that I will add, Mark, is as the parent of a student in that age group, I do hope that campuses will be open. We will move, we will move along next. A reminder, uh, due to the legislative session, we must end the press conference sharply at 4 p.m. Uh, so that's for, both for our guests and for our reporters on the call. We'll move along next to the Hartford Current. Hi, yeah, um, the report calls uh, for 200 to 300,000 tests be available by late August, early September. Is that feasible at this point? What that, Jen? Yeah, so, uh, we we uh, are building that assumption into our statewide testing plan. Uh, obviously, we have a long way to go, but we're uh, making plans to uh, enable that uh, uh, based on the recommendations of the uh, of the group here. It also, I mean, it also calls for substantial uh, testing after after people return to colleges. Is that something that capacity will continue to be available for that? Yeah, consistent with the phases of reopening that, that the governor laid out last week, um, you know, as we look forward, we know there's a number of different organizations and types of businesses that are going to require substantial increases in testing. So that's all being factored into our uh, testing capacity plans going forward. It's, a, it's a, a great question. I'd like to add to that, that um, as the governor stated, the, the higher education is the critical sector of the economy for numerous reasons, but it poses unique challenges to public health. The high density of, of students and scholars creates the opportunity for the kind of intellectual co collisions that make uh, college campuses so exciting, but it's that same opportunity for physical collision that makes the public health challenge so great. So it seems to me that prioritizing higher education campuses for, for testing is an imperative for the, for the state, for, for, for the economy, and, and uh, for the good of, good of public health overall. Move along next to Connecticut Public Media. Hi, Ali Warshawski for WNPR. Um, in terms of maintaining social distancing on campuses, especially something as large as UConn, 
is there going to be a situation where some students are told they're not allowed to return to campus? And do you make that decision on whether or not they're in state or out of state and the necessity of or how close they live to campus? Is that something that's being considered? Yeah, so right now um, I've asked uh, the, fa the faculty to focus on preparing for uh, being fully online because that gives us all the options. But I've asked our administrative uh, teams to focus on uh, re returning at full strength uh, with everyone coming back in the fall and what the implications are for that in terms of testing, but also redesign of facilities, uh, creating greater spaces between seats in the classroom, design redesigning our, our uh, ingress and egress, uh, staggering our scheduling of classes, all of those things to prevent the, the high density. And if we're successful for that, with that, then, then we'll reopen that way. And then if, if uh, by later in the summer, uh, by late June, uh, we see that that's not possible to do, then we'll, we'll take up those other contingencies, which are uh, to, to have only part of the students return or have the students return later and things like that. But right now we're, in, at least at UConn, we're focused on bringing everyone back and designing towards that with that as a goal. Well, and um, is there any update on the Department of Labor getting the unemployment claim system up and running for the self-employed? Sure, I'll give an update on that. So as, uh, as I think most people know, for the, the unemployment insurance benefit for self-employed gig workers, this is an entirely new system that had to be uh, stood up from scratch. Um, with any new system that's being stood up, um, it has to be tested before it's deployed, and in the final testing, there was a bug that was encountered, so they're fixing that. We hope to have that fixed and ready to be launched uh, very, very soon. Um, all of that explanation, of course, is no solace to the people who are waiting for these benefits to come available, and we are feeling that weight every day as we try to get the system live, and we're hopefully very close at this point. Update on the other uh, on the UI processing of UI claims. Uh, 418,000 uh, claims have been filed um, and processed. Uh, so we're at an 88% rate in terms of uh, the processing rate on that. We'll move, Thank you. We will move along next to the Connecticut Mirror. Uh, is there anything that you can see at this point that's going to be a permanent change in how schools operate? You know, sometimes these crises uh, speed up something that was uh, evolving anyway. So is there anything top of mind that fits that category? I can take a first stab at that. I, I think um, the fact that so many faculty were effectively forced to move online this past spring has sort of opened the eyes of many to the potential of online education as a tool for reaching not only enrolled students, you know, in the in the age demographic of colleges and universities, but reaching the wider world um, and reaching people mid-career. So I, I think now that people have been exposed to the fact that in some formats, in some ways, and not all ways, um, online education can be quite effective. Uh, in as a tool for education, I think we'll see a considerable increase in the use of online tools and methods um, by our universities um, uh, around the country and not only in Connecticut, everywhere. Um, Rick, I agree with you, but I'm going to answer that in a slightly different fashion. I think it's become very clear how important all of those things outside of just the classroom are in the full learning experience. So I think what is absolutely clear to me is that as we move forward and as we move beyond this crisis, we recognize the value of all of those pieces of education that happen outside of simply what a faculty member delivers in a classroom and how we capture that and make that a full part of the education system in the future is a lesson that I think we need to learn from this. I, I agree with both Rick and Joanne. They're both right, in fact. And I think what we've learned from online education will lead us to use it 
uh, more effectively to make the time that we have for in-person interaction between students and faculty all the more valuable. But clearly, the message we got, we've got we gotten back from our students is, yeah, we were able to get through our, our courses and learn content, but that's not what we came to the university for. We came really to, to be empowered, uh, to have agency, purpose, and, and identity that goes well beyond uh, just learning facts and knowledge. So uh, Joanne's absolutely right as well. We've learned both those things. We're going to re reconfirm both those things. Right. And a very quick question for the governor. We are now talking about the fall. Um, we have also been speaking earlier about uh, the election in the fall. At this, your executive order, uh, the emergency expires September 9th. Do you have a plan for how you're going to manage the crisis after September 9th? Yeah, my guess is we're going to do the executive order that makes it easier to vote uh, for the primary in August. And we are going to have the legislature come back in the session probably in June. And I'll put front and center that we're going to have to solve um, the opportunity for people to vote uh, remotely in uh, November as well. At least those folks of a certain age that should not be going out to the voting booth. And how about your emergency powers in general? Are, are you, do you anticipate on September 9th having to declare another emergency uh, to continue to manage what looks to be a long-term uh, struggle with COVID-19? I hope not. I mean, I hope that we've got things in track. We've got the executive orders in place. The people see that we're making progress and we can go back to a more normal state of affairs. But. Um, Nothing surprises us with COVID, so time will tell. Thank you. Move along next. Move along next to the Associated Press. Good afternoon. Um, I was curious, have, when you were talking about the testing for college students, was there any thought of having mass testing of students before they get there or quarantine students, students since you have people that are coming from all over the state, all over the country, and in some cases overseas? Yes, that is the recommendation. For non-residential institutions, we simply, we, we don't believe, since it's more like a business and it's mostly local students, we, well, it's entirely local students, we don't uh, believe that complete comprehensive, you know, pre-testing is necessary. Obviously, symptomatic testing is necessary and isolation and, and tracing contacts and testing them will be necessary in those institutions. But for residential institutions, we, we are recommending uh, that a, a screening of everyone, testing of everyone, uh, when they come in the, in the fall, and isolating those who test positive, and then and then depending on what the um, on what the public health uh, thinking is at that time, there may even be a second round of tests, um, uh, uh, and and then some more random screening during the course of the year. The the, the estimated number of tests, um, you know, at the high end, actually is accounting for. The two initial rounds of testing for students in residential settings. And uh, thank you. I'm, thank you for explaining that. And uh, Governor, I was curious, we needed to know if um, the state, when you're following the recommendations set by the White House for reopening, is Connecticut basing um, our criteria on the downward trajectory of documented cases within a 14 day period? or the downward trajectory of positive tests as a percent of total tests within a 14-day period? Uh, for me, the most important metrics, Sue, are hospitalizations, the broadening of our testing, uh, symptomatic and uh, asymptomatic over a period of time, making sure that we have the protective gear, and, and especially the face masks, so that a broader community, the business community, small business, restaurants, has the protective get gear they need to open up. For me, those are three of the key criteria that we got to hit on a consistent basis. So we're not following either one of those regarding uh, positive t and documented tests and cases? Look, I follow it, but as you know, the positive documented tests um, cases is tied to how many tests you're doing. So I do like to um, note that uh, the percentage of testing positive has been going down. I consider that a good sign, but for me, it's not as key an indicator. Thank you. Move along next to News 12 Connecticut. Hi, everyone. So we all know that parties are a big part of the college experience. How are you planning to keep students from 
going to big parties this fall and creating a virus cluster? And, and also, will Greek organizations be allowed to operate as normal this fall? You know, I just comment that um, it's a bit, it, this is a big unknown and a big challenge, but we do have one data point, and that is that you know, while we sent uh, 11,000 students home over the summer, there were 1,000 students still in our dorms who had either no safe place to go or were international students and couldn't get home. And uh, those students uh, were very serious about practicing uh, uh, good public health practices. And by, uh, by being ardent about it, uh, we were able to complete the summer, uh, complete the academic year without a single case uh, um, in the dormitories, which is a remarkable success. While we don't expect to be able to have zero cases in, in the fall with a full, full occupancy, we do think the key to this will be um, the, the adoption of uh, the behavioral norms uh, by the students. And one of the things we're engaging with our students and our faculty right now on is um, having uh, brainstorming sessions and design exercises or charrettes around how can we apply the best insight we can get from behavioral health scholarship uh, in order to encourage uh, the best adoption of good public health practices. And I have a lot of faith in our students to brainstorm uh, ideas for how they can still have uh, an active social life and do it in a safe way and, um, and to essentially be co-owners of the decisions that keep us all safe. Governor, a uh, quick question agree, for you. Oh, sorry. <laughs> uh, Governor, a quick question for you uh, about restaurants. Uh, DCP tells us that they've received 72 complaints about bars and restaurants not following the executive order to just do takeout or delivery. And, and privately, a lot of restaurant owners will tell you they think the number is actually much higher. Um, are you guys doing enough to enforce those rules? Well, by um, the pretext to your question, I think the answer might be no. I mean, that's why we have um, uh, consumer protection. And also, when we get uh, notices about things like that, we notify the local police or we uh, enforce ourselves. Because right now, it is strict. It is strict that uh, food is just for takeout. And on um, May 20th, it will be for takeout and for outside eating. And uh, rules are not uh, worth much unless they're followed and obeyed. I found that overwhelmingly, people are following the dictates including the restaurants, because nobody cares more deeply about how the consumers perceive the safety of going into a facility like that. But if there are particular um, places we should follow up with, we'll do it. We'll move along, we'll move along next to Hearst Connecticut Media. Thanks, Max. Um, this question is for Marco Jake, and this is Ken Dixon, um, and also the UConn and Trinity presidents. Um, what kind of feedback are you getting? Are you are you getting cancellations from international students? Are you getting uh, cancellations of in-state kids who want to take a gap year or because they they think that their campus experience is, is shot for the year? Oh, we haven't. So, we haven't so far. I mean, we are, as everybody else is, looking at certain projections um, of what what could or could not happen. Um, I would I would say that at our community colleges, there has been an increase in the number of folks that are have inquired about community college, and we're starting to see um, uh, greater numbers of applications um, early on in this cycle uh, being being submitted. Um, I think people are waiting; they're waiting to see what the reopen plan will look like, and they are waiting to see what the public health protocols will be before they make any sort of decisions. Uh, we're planning, as I think uh, Tom indicated uh, right now, uh, to uh, be have our campuses fully occupied. But I think at some point in time, we're going to have to have reduction scenarios based on you know where we are in terms of the COVID-19 uh, pandemic. Right. And can you kind of Trinity comment? Yeah, so um, I will comment that our accepted students, you know, we have um, sent out our acceptances and those students who have accepted us are absolutely on track from where they were a year ago. So it seems as though people want to come back 
to college or want to start college. We're very happy to see those signs. But we recognize uh, we do not expect huge numbers of students who will want to do gap years. We do expect to have significant increases in requests for financial aid. So we think people will want to come back, but in order to be able to do so, they will need more financial aid to be able to do so. But we are on track in terms of the number of people who have accepted our offer. And we've extended our deadline so that people have just a little bit more time to see what's going on in the world. Thank you. You know, at, um, our deposit deadline uh, for newly committed students was May 1st. And we were braced for possible reduction in the in the number of deposits we received. And we were pleasantly surprised that our deposits this year were up 17% over last year, which is remarkable. When we compare it to, to neighboring states, that's not the experience across, across the nation. Uh, so yeah, the students who, who um, are coming back there, they are thirsty to come back. Included in that number, uh, you know, are deposits from 400 international students, 300 of whom are overseas right now. We're not at all sure that they can actually make it here, but they want to come. And so, uh, you know, to the point that Mark and Joanne made, you know, I, th I think uh, provided that, that we can open, uh, the students will come back. And I, I think that they will come back even if there are some transition uh, periods, uh, you know, to full opening, um, you know, provided that that we do, um, I think it would be different if we were fully online, then, then those, I would expect those numbers to be different. Thank you. Thank you. Apologies to our press corps members today. Uh, we are up against a hard four o'clock deadline. Uh, so to all the members of the press who are currently in the queue, we'll make sure you are top of the queue for tomorrow's press conference. Uh, with that, uh, Governor Lamont. Let me just say that um, skeptics sometimes say um, working with academic leaders is like herding cats. I have found just the opposite. You have heard of five of our real leaders here in the state of Connecticut working with universities, colleges, state, um, private, community colleges across the state coming up with the best solution. Um, I think I feel confident. I hope you feel confident that we're making the right decisions in terms of education and in terms of safety for all of our kids. Teaching every one of you. Thanks so much for what you're doing. Thanks, Thanks everybody.